Hi, everybody. It's Helen Hillix. I am your host. And today I have the pleasure and honor of welcoming self-empowerment coach, manifestation coach, self-love coach, Kelsey Aida. So let me tell you a little bit about Kelsey before we welcome her on. Kelsey Aida is a next generation thought leader who has taught thousands of people how to own their power and win at life with her inspirational blog, KelseyAida.com. She's also the author of Actually, I Can, The Art of Affirming Yourself to Greatness, and she teaches online courses about manifesting and self-love. Her mission is to empower people to step into their greatness with the same actionable inspiration that helped her beat depression and become one of the most fulfilled people she knows. And you, you know, we'll talk later about how you can contact Kelsey and her wonderful free gift. But for this moment, I want to dive in and say welcome, Kelsey. Hi, thank you. That's such a great introduction. <laughs> uh, well, you, you've earned it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> So, you know, one of the things I really admire about you is that you're a thought leader. And I, you know, I would not use that term about myself because I don't think I am. But I, I really admire that about people who are, <laughs> I don't know, I think of it as good thinkers, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that you really spend the time to go inward and dive into things and, you know, pull them apart and, and I just, that's the reason that I wanted you on the show is because I know that you are such a thoughtful person and have looked at things from so many different directions. And I want you to share that with the audience today. So let's start out with the question of how do you define sex or sexuality, Kelsey? Okay, well, I would define sex and sexuality as two separate things. So to me, sex is the actual physical intimacy of two people um, making love or fucking, for lack of a better word, <laughs> that would be sex. But sexuality is so much broader than that. It doesn't necessarily have to be about sex because each gender has a certain polarization. And even in same-sex couples, there's a polarization. So one person always carries the more masculine essence and one carries the more feminine essence. So to me, to be a feminine woman, because that is my essence, that's my sexuality. A lot of power comes from that um, I use my sexuality to interact with my whole life not just when I'm physically intimate with someone so for example as a woman uh, who identifies with a more sexual feminine essence uh, feminine sexuality I feel more natural and at ease and more in my power when I'm open to new opportunities, when I'm receiving um, love from people, when people are recognizing my radiance, I like to shine. Um, so these types of things, I'm getting goosebumps as I say it, um, are like me interacting with my life through my sexuality, but it's not necessarily all about sex. I, I love what you're saying. I mean, this again, this is why you are a thought leader <laughs> is because I, I love what you're saying. And I know this is not something unique to you, but I don't believe any other uh, of my speakers has talked about this specific thing is that you, we all want to feel powerful in our lives, don't we? And we all want to feel powerful sexually. And we confuse that with feeling masculine. Uh, that's my interpretation. Anyway, we confuse power with with males and the masculine energy and i think it's because we live in such a male dominated world we still do but you're saying such a brilliant thing which is you find your power through identifying with your femininity because that fits you it's not that every woman should do that but that fits you and so through that receiving energy, because that's the feminine, right? The receptive energy. Through that energy, you find your empowerment. And that's how you relate to the world. I just think that is such an important point I want to make for the men and the women in the audience is that empowerment comes from being you, embracing you. 
and not not being that assertive driving energy necessarily. It can look all different ways. Yeah, and like there are moments in my life when I've been more inspired by my masculine energy because we both have both. We all have both. Like you're not just only 100% feminine or 100% masculine. Like there's a give and take. There's a time to push and achieve. There's a time to pull back and receive, you know. So at different periods in your in your life, you're going to be in different aspects of either your feminine or your masculine, which is totally normal and totally fine. But I would say for the majority of women, I'm guessing, I mean, this isn't an exact statistic, but I would say about 70 to 80% of women are going to identify more with their feminine sexual essence. Naturally, they're going to feel more at home in their bodies. They're going to feel more powerful. They're going to feel more at ease when they're practicing, um, some of the qualities of this feminine essence and the same goes for men. Majority of men are going to feel more at ease in their bodies, more powerful, more strong, more um, driven. These are like some of the characteristics of the masculine when they're embodying those masculine characteristics. And of course, like I said, in same sex couples or whatever, like there's usually polarization. So one has one, one has the other, or sometimes like I've been in a relationship where in the dynamic, I was always in the masculine energy and I didn't even leave space for my partner to be in his masculine. So he had to submit and be not submit, but he had to be in the feminine because there has to be polarization. And if both are in the same, it's going to repel like a magnet that's facing the wrong way. Like when you put two magnets together and they're like not pushing together because it's facing the wrong way. That's what happens when both people are in the same essence. That's why a lot of times if relationships are out of balance and the woman is in the masculine, which I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that unless if you don't like it or if it's detrimental to your relationship, then a lot of times the other partner who maybe might be the male in this case has to basically like be whipped per se, or the woman is wearing the pants, always in charge, you know, leading the relationship all the time. And I've been in dynamics like that. And I realized it was so exhausting because that's actually not my true nature. I was just doing that because that's what I thought was right. That's what I thought. I, I thought I wanted all that control. I thought I had to be that way. Like society really values all the masculine gifts, but kind of shits on all the feminine gifts. And I'm coming to terms with like, wow, these feminine gifts are amazing, trying to identify what they are and then embracing them and being like, no, both masculine and feminine are beautiful. But a lot of people regard the masculine traits of ambition, go-getterness, achieving, building, direction, going forward. That's what society really values more. That thrusting, the thrusting energy. Mm -hmm rather than the receiving energy. It's so interesting, Kelsey. You know, you're so far ahead of the game in, in realizing that at your age. You know, I grew up in the kind of the, the blossoming of the feminist movement back in 1970s. And I took that on, you know, women have to be, you know, this way. And it, it's caused untold damage. I, I'm glad that the generations subsequently are coming back into a better balance, you know, of, of acknowledging let's honor the feminine rather than turning women into men. Yes, please. And women would be so relieved too. And so would men, because I feel like at this stage, um, it's been so extreme because we were so suppressed for so long. And like, we still are that we're like, we right. want to be everything the same as men. And it's like, actually right. deep down, we don't want to be the same. We just want to be respected for what we bring to the table. Right. Which is actually um, very different. It's opposite. It's the yin and the yang. It's complementary. You right. know, and if we can't be equal unless we bring the honor and the power to the feminine so that women don't have to be men. So yeah, that, that's just awesome. I'm just already so excited and have goosebumps uh, about our conversation because that's exactly right. You know, where sexuality comes in is in that polar, you know, the polar, I, I wouldn't want to say opposites because you're right about that. Also, I think the, the balance, we each have both, but there has to be polarity. I, can you say a little, I, I mean, you said already about the, you know, if we're exactly alike, then we're going to repel. But I wanted to just emphasize that a little bit because a, a, another one of my speakers, Ray Doctor, talked about that 
also about the polarity and how important that is. And in case the people missed his interview, I want to emphasize that because you don't, you don't need to be exactly alike to be equal. Yeah. So I think the polarity is all about embracing your true sexuality and not necessarily in, well, especially in the bedroom when you're having sex, it's important to have polarization, but um, just in life in general. So some of the qualities that I attribute to the feminine would be being open, going with the flow, being connected to nature, creating safe spaces, being nurturing, being compassionate, valuing um, uh, connection. Um, And then on the other hand, some of the gifts of the masculine would be having a sense of responsibility, um, really pushing forward, committing to things, um, um, creating safety, like physical safety for women and children, um, being really ambitious, building things. Um, to me, these are all more uh, masculine gifts. So when both people can show up to a relationship or a partnership with their gifts really polarized, that's what causes super attraction. Because like for me as a feminine woman, when I see a man that's really connected to his purpose and really in service and building something for himself and takes charge and leads the way, that to me is like the best turn on ever. Because I actually, as a feminine, in some regards, I kind of do want a man to create a safe container for me to be free and wild in. Because the feminine is very unpredictable, very emotional. It's like going with the tides, you know? And I feel like if a man created a safe container for me and he's like that stability and that rock, then I would be free to have more freedom in my feminine inside of the relationship, inside of that safe container. So both parties, if they really are in their masculine and feminine, it works perfectly because they enjoy giving you what you need and you enjoy giving them what they need because the masculine loves receiving our feminine gifts of nurturing, of caretaking, of building connection. So it's it's a give and take that works perfectly harmoniously when both partners are really living their sexuality. And, and I want to throw, throw in what you said before, that each of us also needs to own our own opposite, because I definitely do not want a man who is just all in his masculine energy. Yeah, I, I want to have balance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want a man who is able to be nurturing and caretaking to me, and who is able to cry, and who's able to be vulnerable you know, and, and a man, I think, wants a woman. I mean, I think one of the painful things about our society is that we have had this image of the man has got to be all powerful, and that leaves him so alone. Yeah. So it, I feel like as the women, I, I think what you're saying is as the women own our own power, it allows us to come into that healthy balance, accentuating the feminine and for the men to come into their own power in a different way. Yeah. And like I said earlier, it's not about being rigid and being feminine all the time or being masculine all the time because we both have both and we have balance. And like I said, there are times in life or even times throughout the day where you need to be more masculine or more feminine. You know, if you're a woman and let's say you're a lawyer and you have this really like responsibility job, you're going to have to show up in masculine mode to work and like do it all day so you can get done, achieve, win the cases, help the people, do whatever you got to do. And then when you come home, at night maybe you can switch into your feminine mode you know and that's when you have amazing sex (laughs) well let's talk about that amazing sex for a minute because (laughs) you know that's that's what we are talking about one of the questions that i have is you know what do you believe people want from sex i think it depends on the person And in general, I feel like what people want from sex, well, if they're like mostly healed and they don't have a lot of issues around it, I would say they want connection and intimacy. They want to be seen. They want to be felt. They want to give. They want to receive uh, simultaneously, you know. But if someone's wounded, I feel like they want sex to fill a void. 
So they go around having sex with everyone because they think it's going to give them the short-term pleasure that's going to lead to happiness. But guess what? Short-term pleasure is short-term. So it's not really going to solve your issue. If you're coming from a space of emptiness and you need to be filled with sex, then that's going to be something that you'll probably quickly or maybe not so quickly realize isn't really a long-term solution. So I feel like if you're in a healthy space, at least for me, speaking from my experience, I always want sex to be a form of connection, a form of intimacy, a really magical experience, um, something where I can go into my feminine mode in a really extreme way and receive. Because if you think about the feminine body, there's a hole. We have a vagina. We're supposed to receive somebody's penis. Like it goes inside of us. We have to be open to allow that to happen. Like that's part of the feminine jam, I guess. Right. And whether whether you're lesbian or gay or whatever, you know, it's still the one playing that feminine role is yeah. in that receiving energy. So I love what you're saying that if you're if you're a relatively balanced person, what you really want is connection and intimacy. And I think even if you're not, even if you have trauma and Yeah, it, everybody still, kinda wants that yeah, at the end yeah, of the day. We still we still want that, but we don't know how to get it. Exactly. And I think that's where, you know, therapy or counseling, you know, or coaching, that's where that comes in is that, you know, you get to heal those issues so that you, you know how to actually create connection and intimacy. But I think it's not just people who have trauma in their lives either that go over to the side of filling that void. I mean, do you... Do you believe that our culture feeds into that too? It's like you got to be hot, you got to be sexy, you know, you got to show your body, you got to, you know, I don't know. It, it it just feels to me like that's a big part of why people get off course. Yeah, there's a definitely a heavy hookup culture. So I feel like that leads people to feeling pressured to feel like they have to have all these sexy moments and all these partners that they go around with for sure. I love how you said that, heavy hookup culture. <laughs> I mean, again, these are things I don't use in my daily yeah. life, but they are so appropriate. I, I love that. Well, so, there's nothing wrong with hooking up either, but if it leaves you feeling empty because you're doing it so much with so many different people and you're giving your energy away to all these different people and your energy is getting all scrambled with other people's energies because when you have sex with someone, you're exchanging DNA, literally, and you're exchanging energy. So you create a, a cord with that person energetically. So if you have a million cords going in a million different directions because you're having sex with everyone, you're going to start to lose sight of yourself, you know? So personally, I am very choosy about anyone that I decide to have intercourse with because I know I'm going to be, um, like, well, one, I'm going to end up emotionally tied to them to some degree and two, um, energetically tied. And I really value my vibration being clean and pure and high. So I'm very picky about who I decide to have intercourse with. I think that's a, a really important point that I don't know whether anybody else has discussed that or not, but that the, the reality that when we hook up with somebody else that we are not in a committed monogamous relationship with, we, we generally pay a price. And you yeah. know, I think it depends, it, you know, it depends on your attitude about it. I mean, there are people that can engage in, you know, consensual, conscious, mature sexuality, and they, they have a mutual caring just because they're committed to creating that in that moment. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think I was ever good at that, but <laughs> I, think I think it is a lot about the intention, like how you're saying, like if you, let's say, for example, you're really attracted to someone, but you know, it's not compatible for a relationship, but you would like to engage in intercourse. And if they're game and you're game and you talk about it before and you're like, Hey, you know, like, I don't feel like we're really compatible for a partnership, but like, I'm super attracted to you. Like, let's make some magic. And you guys both agree to it. Then like, go for it, you know, have that great moment, have that connection with someone. But I just don't think it's the wisest to go around giving your energy out to everyone all the time. Because if you don't do your research about people, they might have some energetic baggage that you're not aware of that you're going to be taking on by having sex with them. And also like, 
you want to have self-respect and you want to keep your body as your temple. So who do you want to let into your temple, essentially? Who's worthy? You know, I, I appreciate that connection you're making. And I think that brings in the sacred sexuality, the spirituality aspect of it. That's really what you're talking about when you're talking about, you know, that our energies get mingled in the process of, of having sex and that, that consciousness, that awareness that you're bringing to it is so important in feeling good about yourself. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I feel like that's in the hookup society, hookup culture. We're not talking about that, even though what people really want from sex is connection and intimacy. What they end up doing is hooking up and then feeling their energy all messed up and they don't know why. Yeah, I think if people have self-love issues or self-esteem issues and then they expect more from the sex, like they expect it to turn into a relationship or some sort of commitment or connection and they don't get that, then they feel rejected and they take it personally because they don't have the understanding of their worth yet. Not that it's not there. They just don't recognize it. You know, they don't realize how divinely perfect they already are. And so they go looking for validation outside of themselves. Like, oh, I want this boy to tell me that I'm pretty or I want this man to say I'm the sexiest woman ever or whatever. And it's because they can't give themselves those validations. They can't give themselves those compliments. They don't see themselves in that light. So if somebody doesn't give that to them and that's what they're looking for, then they're going to be sorely disappointed and end up in a worse emotional state after as opposed to they were before because they're looking for something that, other people can or can't give them, but it's out of their control whether or not that person is going to validate and compliment you or build your self-esteem. Like you're the only person who is really responsible for building your own self-esteem and recognizing your own worth and loving yourself. So when you don't know how to do that, of course you still need that. That's like a human need. So you're going to try and go get it from other people. But when you don't get it, then you're so disappointed because you take it personally like, oh, that person rejected me because I'm not good enough, even though it has nothing to do with you being good enough or not good enough. It's just sad that you can't see that you are good enough and you don't need other people to validate that for you. But right now you do because you don't know how to validate that for yourself yet. Yeah, I I really love what you're saying, Kelsey. And I love that you use the word responsibility. Because that's something I know you see in your clients and I see in my clients all the time is that because they didn't get what they needed in their childhood, they don't know how to take responsibility for their own happiness. They still think, oh, my parents didn't give it for me, so I'm fucked. Yeah. <laughs> for, you know, forever, forever. Yeah. There's nothing I can do about that because I didn't get it in my childhood. And I think that's something I really want to emphasize and I'm so glad you brought up is that no we are responsible we can give ourselves what we didn't get before yeah you can parent yourself and I think a lot of people don't realize that they can and probably should be reparenting themselves and learning how to soothe themselves and learning how to build up their own self-esteem and even if you did get that stuff in childhood it doesn't mean you're set for life like you still got to keep it up on your own (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like I had a great childhood. I had great parents. They built up my self-esteem, my ego. They told me how great I was and I still have to keep doing it all the time. You know, it's not like I had a lack of that and now I'm looking for it, but I still need it and I need to give it to myself. So I do. And I think too, you brought up another issue of, you know, a lot of times our parents tell us how great we are, but we, we know we've got weaknesses and it's, <laughs> and, and it's the weaknesses that, that keep us from feeling like we are totally worthy and lovable. Um, but I don't want to get off onto that really. I want to go back to the spirituality issue and to talk, ask you about how do you think that connection to the universe, to oneness, to God however you articulate that or believe in that, how does that relate to sexuality? Yeah, well, you just said it. It's about the oneness. So it's when two bodies, two minds, two hearts, and just even if it's just one moment, one passionate moment, become one. It's like all your boundaries from one perspective. It's like all your boundaries disappear and you merge with this person's energy or body or however you want to view it. And I think sex is one of 
the most profound experiences and the closest thing in our human bodies that we can get to oneness, which is why we enjoy it so much because oneness is our true nature. So to be able to experience that in a physical sensation, that's what feels so good is connection, oneness, unity, bringing together the two polar opposites. You know, that's what makes sex such a fulfilling experience when it is fulfilling. (laughs) When it is, when it has that sacred element to it. Right, right. I think of it not as merging the two people, but as the two people merging with the oneness. Mm-hmm. I know, and I don't know if that's a different thing or if we're just saying the it's same. It's just a slightly thing. different perspective. I mean, so in, in my belief right now, this is what I believe, that right we now. are all... <laughs> yeah, right now, because yeah. you are always evolving. It's always changing. And me too. So it's like, okay, on this date, this is what I believe. Next yeah. week, ask me, I might say something different. Could be different next week. But right now, I feel like we are all aspects of God. It's like there's God, and then God was like, I'm going to break myself into 7 billion people so I can experience myself in 7 billion different ways. And then when you interact with another person, it's like God... God experiencing itself from a different perspective all the time. So when you're having sex, you are experiencing God through that person and they're experiencing God through you. And together you are also experiencing like the higher or whatever you want to call it. Right. Spirit or God or the universe. Um, It all goes together. I think we're saying exactly the same thing then, Um, which I I really love, of course, because it's what I believe, but (laughs) yeah, I do. I think it works. You know, it works in the bedroom, that <laughs> idea that we are little chunks of God and therefore... You little know, chunks. <laughs> yeah, little chunks of God. And therefore, we, we are divine and our sexuality is divine. I, this leads me to, to talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, the issue of shame. Oh, yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, I get nervous talking about sex to this day because I still feel there's some shame inside of me that's been programmed and I haven't, I'm not done working through my own shame. And so I grew up with a Catholic background. So anyone who has practiced any type of like Catholicism will know that there's lots of Catholic guilt around sex, sexuality. It reminds me of there's this one scene in that funny show called Jane the Virgin. And Jane is this virgin, but she gets accidentally inseminated. So she becomes pregnant and she's like this pregnant virgin. And so her whole life, she was like saving herself because her abuela, her grandma, her super Catholic grandma was like, if you have sex, do you see this flower? And she's like, yes, grandma, I see it. And she, the grandma crushes the flower. And she's like, this is what happens to you when you have sex. And then she gives the flower to Jane and she's like, now try and fix the flower to how it was before. And she tries because she's like a little kid and she's like, well, I can't fix it. And the grandma's like, exactly. Once you have sex, you can never go back. Like it's the ultimate sin or whatever to have sex outside of marriage and blah, blah, blah. So that's essentially my background too. So it's a very taboo topic. It's very inappropriate. It's very much, you have to wait until you're in a marriage. Um, which obviously I didn't cause I'm not married and I've had sex. So. <laughs> Luckily, my parents are much more diluted than like my grandma and it's getting like more out of the out of the ancestry. And like, I swear to like never be like that to my kids, at least as consciously as I can be about it. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, that's kind of my background. A lot of shame and a lot of guilt around sex. And you know what? I I didn't even grow up in a in a religious home. Um, but I had some kind of innate spirituality and I would take myself to church even as a child. And, and I, I didn't hear a lot of that. I did as a teenager, I guess, hear that when I went to church, but you know, it's so true that the, that belief in our culture, because we, whether or not your individual family was a little more progressive than others, we still all have grown up in this puritanical culture. Yeah. And we get such mixed messages, like I was saying about my own experience. You know, it's like the hookup culture and the, you know, you've got to have big boobs and, and you know, the, the whole uh, uh, Madison Avenue approach to what you're supposed to look like. And then you have on the, uh, which is all sexy. 
And then when you have on the other side is, but don't have sex until you're married. It's nasty. (laughs) It's nasty. And and self-exploration, self-pleasuring. Oh, my God. I mean, I remember. That's even more taboo, I feel uh, like. I know. I remember (laughs) this was probably, yeah, I don't know, 20 something years ago, I had a family come in and they had trouble with their teenager. And, you know, we were talking about the Catholic church, somehow they're Catholic. And I said, I remember when uh, masturbation was a mortal sin and they said, oh, it still is. (laughs) And it's like, I just about fell off of my chair. I just couldn't (laughs) believe that that was still the truth. But, and, and your metaphor for crushing the flower, I... (laughs) <laughs> One of my other experts was talking about the whole history of the conservative Christian church. And they actually would do that in youth groups. They would bring in flowers and oh, no. talk to everybody <laughs> and tell them to crunch them up and then try to make them a beautiful flower again. I mean, they would actually do that. And, yeah. uh, you know, your, your abuela was... <laughs> well, that's not my abuela. That's Jane the Virgin's abuela oh, on the yeah, CW. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> but right. I mean, my grandma would probably have done something similar. We don't really talk about it as much in my family, but it's like the unspoken thing. Like, no, no. <laughs> well, and that's what most of us get is the, yeah. un- the unspoken thing. And unspoken messages bring a lot of shame. Yeah. So, so how do you work with your clients around shame and that unspoken message that they should not be engaging in sexuality. Yeah. Well, one, it's about what it's about doing what feels right to you and not putting so much weight on what other people say. And the only reason we do care so much at maybe even a subconscious level, if not consciously about what our parents and family have to say about it is because we fear that if we do what we want, they'll stop accepting us. And at the end of the day, we'll end up alone, which is like every human's worst fear because we actually need each other and we need community and we need connection to survive. Like that's a survival thing. So the very deepest core fear if you go to any limiting belief that you have or anything that bothers you, if you bring it down to the core, it's usually, oh, I'm scared to be alone. These people will leave me. They'll reject me, whatever. Right. So once you can kind of understand that, then you can move forward and be like, okay, is my family really going to reject me? Maybe, maybe not. Would If they did reject you, would you be open to building a new family of friends or, you know, like building your own tribe? You, most, not everyone sticks with the family that they were God-given. And we, put, as souls, we put ourselves in that situation for whatever lessons we need to learn, whatever experiences we want to have. And some people's experience is I need to learn how to get away from these people so I can build a better community and have connection with people who love me unconditionally and who support my my decision is and my wellness. I think that's just right on is that, you know, if you say, if you help them say, okay, what does your family believe about it? And, and does that make sense to you? Or is, or is that purely brainwashing? Yeah. And, it's about questioning your programming and seeing where it all comes yeah, from. Right. And sometimes yeah. just looking at it and seeing, Oh, that was my grandma's belief. That's not actually mine is enough for you to start healing and moving forward. And you can respect her for being in her ways. That's probably what her mom taught her. That's probably what her mom taught her. Like, it's her programming just like it's your programming you know so you can't blame people for trying to shame you or whatever from one perspective you could because everyone has free will and we've all kind of agreed to this on a soul level so when we infringe on each other's free will it's like a no-no collectively but from another it perspective like all the time yeah from another perspective you can't blame them because that's just their conditioning just like they pass it down to you someone passed it down to them and maybe they just weren't aware enough to get rid of it or they didn't have the desire they're just fine with it like that. And that's their own thing. So that's fine. Yeah, I, I highly doubt if most people are really fine with it. I think it, the, the, the former is much more the truth, which is they just don't know better. Yeah. They, we, you know, we, we typically have not been taught to think. And again, that's why I love your, you know, next generation thought leader moniker is because if we all took it on to be thought leaders, you know, and really examine what we've been taught and unpack all those mistaken limiting beliefs, 
that's, yeah, it's just that's taking freedom. the time. Yeah, it's taking the time to look at it and question it. And does this feel right for me? Does this feel like the truth for me? Like, I remember when I was going to church when I was little and like my parents never really forced it or anything. They were really casual about it. Like we weren't great Catholics. Like we would go on the holidays or whatever. And my dad like went to Catholic school and he was over it by the time he was an adult. So he was like, go to church if you want. Don't go. I don't really care. My mom, she likes to go to church sometimes still because she feels that that's a way to connect with her dad who's passed away. So she'll try and encourage us to go sometimes. And sometimes I will. And now I don't really anymore. But when I used to, I remember like some things would say and I'd be like oh yeah like be nice to your neighbor like blah blah blah. I like this feels good to me I can get behind it and then other things like everything you do is a sin and you have to repent every single thing that you do even just being born is like a sin and you have to be baptized to like be reborn or whatever the fuck and in my body even just as a kid I was just like yeah I'm not, re- not really feeling it I'm just not <laughs> feeling like that's my truth <laughs> and I always had that like underlying sense like yeah, no. And I was a kid. So I was like, whatever, like, this is kind of weird. Like, I don't really know if that's true. I don't know if that's the right way to do it. I mean, my parents are bringing me here. So like, it's fine. I don't want to cause trouble in the family or whatever. But am I choosing to really believe that? I don't know. And then when I became more of an adult, I was like, oh, no, (laughs) definitely no, not for me. (laughs) Well, and you know, you're bringing up a really good point too, Kelsey, that I think almost every client I've ever had or my husband also was raised Catholic and he too was aware as a small child hmm not so much Uh, (laughs) that that, that just doesn't resonate with me and I think kids do know they do know whether that resonates with them or not Um, but but as you were saying we are so afraid of of ending up alone and because Literally, when we're tiny, we would die without our tribe. Yeah, it's the survival. We carry that. Thing. Yeah, we carry that, even though it's not true anymore. Like you said, you know, we could be thrown out of the church or out of the family or whatever, and we could be totally fine by creating our own tribe. So, I, I'd like you to t- to talk about um, some of the actual actionable items that you encourage people to you already have, you know, in terms of self-love and unpacking, you know, the limiting beliefs and that. But if you could, you know, give the audience some specific things to take away. Yeah. Um, If you guys are into reading, my favorite author (laughs) on the topic of sexuality and sacred sexuality and polarization of the genders and all these things, and he has a lot of similar ideas as I do about it, Um, His name is David Data. That's the author. And he writes amazing books about using sex to get closer to God uh, or not using sex to, but like using sex as a tool to become closer to God um, about accentuating your femininity or your masculinity. Um, Basically any book by David Data is like so amazing. I read them all. I highlight everything. I'm just like, yes, yes, yes. Like the whole time I read it. So if you're resonating with what I'm saying, you'll probably resonate with those books a lot. Um, he wrote that really popular book called, um, the way of the superior man. And I read that book a few years ago when I was realizing that I was basically acting like a man my whole life until recently. And that really helped me to come into my femininity because I saw I could see clearly like what masculinity looks like and that I was doing it. And that's why I felt so tired all the time. And that's why I felt so run down because I was acting out of my own element. I was out of balance, you know? And so that book really helped me when I was first awakening to my sexual essence. Um, Even though it's technically a guidebook for men on how to like be really powerful men and be in their masculine and how to have healthy relationships with the divine feminine and the sacred feminine. Um, reading it as a woman was actually really valuable. I read one of his books about uh, love letters to women or, or oh, mm-hmm. I can't remember. Did you like it? it? Uh, I like parts of it. I, mean, I think it was called dear lover or something like that. Something like I think that. I know which one you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. And then there's another one that I'm reading called, uh, Ah, dang it. I think it's called Sacred Intimacy or something about intimacy and union. And I don't know. They're all just really good. Any book by him, I've really enjoyed. Also, um, 
if you're a woman and you're interested in learning about or exploring like your self pleasure, I really like using crystals. So a lot of people don't know what yoni eggs are, but they're basically these little crystal eggs that you use for self pleasuring. And you can even like hang out all day with a crystal inside of you. And for me, it's been really nice because I always set an intention with the crystal to help it clear any negative feelings I might have about my sexuality or to help me clear any heavy emotions. And so I'll have it in my body and I ask the crystal to kind of absorb it all for me. And then when I take it out and wash it off, I feel like it's like a cleanse. So it's a way to like self pleasure, but incorporate the more spiritual metaphysical aspect also. They also make wands, like pleasure wands out of crystals. You can use rose quartz. That's a really good crystal for any type of self-love. It's really gentle. It has a really like um, like soothing vibration. Um, I use obsidian. I have an obsidian egg, which to me, it's a black crystal. So it absorbs like all the negativity. I feel that that's more intense stone to work with than the rose quartz. Um, but working with crystals during self-pleasuring has been kind of like a game changer and a way for me to really experience my sexuality in a more sacred, intentional way. I love that. And, you know, it, it's interesting because it, 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 from my perspective, it addresses the issue of should you use sex toys, mm-hmm. you know, vibrators or whatever. And it, it's like, you know, okay, yes, you can use accessories, and, and if they're sacred symbols, it's going to bring a completely different feeling to you and a different motivation in using them than a vibrator. Well, if you're putting plastic in your body, that's a really different energy than putting a rose quartz crystal in your body. <laughs> There's a very different vibration going well, on. That's what I'm saying. I, I think it's, And I'm not judging one as wrong or better or worse. I'm just saying, like, what do you choose to put in your body? You know, it's just different. Right, right. So I just, I, no one else has mentioned that. And so I just wanted to highlight that, that people have those questions sometimes, you know, of well, what do you think about this or that? And I, I really appreciate that you're bringing in the use of those earth materials and the, the natural materials that are imbued with spiritual powers, you know, into your self-sexual experiences. Yeah. And it's a way to connect with nature too, because rocks are from the earth. So you're just killing all the birds with the stone, <laughs> literally <laughs> a <killing> stone. <laughs> <laughs> so what else? I know that one of your focuses is radical self-love. Can you, because I totally agree with something you said in the very beginning of the interview, which is about, um, how self-love is the cornerstone of, sexuality that's healthy so can you can you bring in a a few of your favorite exercises or tips about enhancing self-love yeah um a really practical thing that people can start doing today is ask yourself when i go to have sex with someone or i want sex or i want a relationship why do I actually want it? Like, what do I think that that person is going to give me? Is it admiration? Is it quality time? Is it compliments? Is it recognizing your radiance? Is it pleasuring you? Like, what do you um, want to get from that person? And then flip the tables and say, okay, how can I gift this to myself? How can I give myself quality time? How can I give myself praise and admiration? How can I give myself pleasure? You know, and when you take the responsibility off of that person, which it's not their responsibility in the first place, unless they agree to it and they want to, then you become so much more powerful and autonomous. And when you do attract the right partner or the right experience to have sex, it's going to be like next level because you can take care of yourself. And so that extra person coming into your life, into your world, into your experience is just going to be like an added bonus. But when you absolutely need it because you don't know how to give those things to yourself, that's when you run into a problem, a chronic problem until you learn how to love yourself. So that's a really like profound practice is to identify what do I actually want to get from these other people in relationships and intercourse and whatever. And how can I gift that to myself? Like what's a small way I can spend more quality time with myself today. If I want connection with someone, like 
I love eye gazing because when you just sit and stare with someone like that's just like magic to me because you're seeing into their soul. You don't have to say anything. You can just sit, look at each other for five minutes. That's like my favorite thing. Most people think it's so boring and horrible. They obviously aren't into connection like I am, which is fine. And so like, if I want that connection with someone else, I can also just sit in front of the mirror and do that with myself for five minutes (laughs) and I'm connecting with myself and I'm giving myself the gift of my own presence, you know? So self-love is really about, meeting your own needs as much as you can. And I'm not saying we don't need other people because we do. We need other people to help us meet needs outside of ourselves. We need other people to connect with, but you also need to first give yourself as much as you possibly can. I love that. And I feel like that in a way you just gave us two tools, you know, the gift of identifying what you're looking for with other people and then giving it to yourself and then the exercise of eye gazing whether yes. it's with a partner or without a partner that I think those are really powerful exercises um so oh I have another tip that I want to talk about really quick do we have time <laughs> okay so this is kind of like a tantric practice but basically if you do have a partner um what you can do is you can do the eye gazing and another practice that i like to do with my partners right now i don't have one technically but when i do have a partner what i like to do is i like to lay on their body and um, like really connect with their heartbeat and sync up our breathing so if you can lay with your partner feel into their heartbeat sync up your breathing for five ten minutes or you can both like sit in the nude holding hands eye gazing sync up your breathing um that's going to make your sex like 10 times better because you're bringing that spiritual aspect you're going to feel really connected to that person they're going to be able to feel into you you're going to be able to feel into them and the magic will be like next level so that's another like really practical thing you can start doing today is Connecting with your partner first, emotionally, um, on a soul level, breathing wise, eye contact wise, and then from there you can you'll be inspired to be physical pretty quickly after that. <laughs> I love that, and and if you're not, then you know to be able to feel the the fulfillment of that. Yeah, because that in and of itself, like let's say you're too tired, you don't want to have sex, like you guys can just sit and eye gaze for a few minutes and that's going to be really fulfilling. Right. And I love the sinking, the breathing, you know, what yeah. my husband and I spoon is, um, uh, you know, th- something we learned is spooning. Yeah. You know, he's behind, which again, mm-hmm. one of those masculine feminine points. Yeah, because the feminine feels like safe and protected. Exactly. exactly. Mm-hmm. And then sinking the breathing, you know, while you're spooning. So that, that's really. Yeah. And when you sink your breathing, you're actually sinking your vibration. So that way you guys can be on the same page. So for example, if you guys both have crazy lives outside of each other and you both come home at five, you're both tired or whatever from work and you're on different pages and you're not connected, you can just be like, Hey babe, can we sync our frequency? Or if you don't want to sound weird like that, you can be like, Hey, like let's check in with each other. Let's just have a moment. And you can just sit on the couch and for five minutes, just connect. And then the rest of the night will just feel so much more calm and connected to your partner and Mm -hmm. you'll feel really more seen and understood. In my I experience. Love I love mm-hmm. that. And it's not weird. I mean, I think even if, if a guy or a woman thinks that sounds weird when you say, <laughs> can we sync our vibration? Once they experience it and they experience the benefit yeah. of it, they're not going to think that's weird. At, True. Anymore. <laughs> they're going to be like, that's because, awesome. Yeah, let's, let's do that, baby. Let's do that. <laughs> so, wonderful, wonderful tips. I can't wait to write those down and, you know, uh, and those will be printed, you know, in the email that go to people about, you know, the specific things that you're recommending. You know, I want to say something about that, the intention part that, you know, you were just talking about, let's sync up our vibrations with our partner. And, and this is what it sounds like. And my understanding of manifesting is you're really becoming conscious of what you what you really are in alignment with and then you're sinking your vibration with the universe yeah that's the whole point of figuring out how you want to feel from that manifestation and then aiming to feel that way now intending to feel that way now because then you become a vibrational match to the experience that you are wanting to have that would essentially make you feel that way except now you already feel that way because you've cultivated it inside of yourself and when the experience does come because it will it is just like a cherry on top 
Yeah, so it's so much about, it, I, I just want to make the connection all the way back to connection and intimacy. That's what, we, that's what we're looking for. And these are all tools to bring you into that energy of connection and intimacy. So thank you so much. I loved interviewing you. I know the audience is going to get so much from your wisdom and from your experiences and from all the wonderful tools you've developed So thank you so much for coming today, Kelsey. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed it.